Hello, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you all so much for, for joining me tonight. My name is Noel A. Figueroa. I am your host of the PWP sessions, that is the Poets with Purpose sessions. Um, we are now back from a short summer break. This is episode 13 of the PWP Sessions podcast. And tonight, um, I have the, have the privilege and the honor of interviewing uh, uh, another poet and an author by the name of by the name of, excuse me, by the name of Robert Gibbons. Um, before we get into the interview, I'm just going to share my screen and, and, and give a little background of Robert before, before we dive into the interview. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Now, as I stated, this is episode 13 of the PWP Sessions podcast. And for those not familiar with the podcast, the PWP Sessions is, is a show, a podcast where I interview, conduct interviews with new or established authors of poetry and, um, and, feature, and I feature a performance of their work along with an audience Q&A session in the end. I am the host, Noelle Figueroa. I am, I am a poet, author, blogger, workshop facilitator, and event host, and I am the creator of the PWP Sessions. And tonight's guest is, is Robert Gibbons, and this is just a, a, a bio to um, share about him before we get started with the interview. Robert Anthony Gibbons, a native Floridian, came to New York City in 2007 in search of his muse, Langston Hughes, and found a vibrant contemporary poetry community at the Cornelia Street Cafe, the Green Pavilion, Nomad's Choir, Brownstone Poets, Hydrogen Jukebox, Saturn Series, and Phoenix, among other venues. His first book, Close to the Tree, was published by the New York-based Three Rooms Press in 2012. He is an Obsidian Fellow in, tw in 2020. He is a Cave Canem Fellow 2019, from 2019 to 2021, and has received residencies from the Norman Mailer Foundation in 2017, and the Disquiet International Literary Program in 2018. In 2018, he completed his MFA at City College. Robert has been published in over 30 literary magazines and in several notable anthologies. Recent publication credits include Peregrine, Expound, Promethean, 
Turtle Island Quarterly, Killer Whale, and Sweet Sun Valley Review, and the Bronx Memoir Project, Volume 2, published by the Bronx Council of the Arts. Robert's first collection, Close to the Tree, was published by Three Rooms Press in 2012. His chapbook, Flight, was published by Poets Wear Prada in 2019. You Almost Home Boy, published by Harlequin Creatures in 2019, and his collaboration with Brooklyn-based visual artist Amy Williams, Some Little Words, was published by 440 Gallery in Brooklyn in 2021. Now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, tonight's guest, Robert Gibbons. Hey, Robert, good evening. Glad to have you on this podcast tonight. How are you doing today? How you doing? Um, um, Noel, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm just trying to really figure this lighting part out. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out the lighting. Yeah, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm having some struggles, but it's working. It's working out. Excellent. It's working Excellent. out. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Happy to be on the show. Yeah. So I'm gonna yeah, begin, thank you. I'm gonna begin um, by posing a question as I do with all my previous guests. Who is Robert? Right. Well, it's been a long journey, Noel. It's been like uh, a long, long, long journey. I uh, I come from South Florida, so I come from a little place on the bottom of Lake Okeechobee called Belle Glade, Florida, and um, it is mostly a uh, uh, area known for sugar, sugar cane. So I came from a big area that's enclosed by sugar cane. And I, I was fortunate enough that I had a mother that was a third grade teacher that really inspired me at an early age to pursue the love of learning. I'll say it like that. Right, right. Now, what was your, what, 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 what prompted your decision to get into poetry? Like what was your motivation or inspiration to start writing poetry? I guess like, I guess the church, you know, reading Christmas poems and Easter poems and Easter speeches, we back at that time, it was a big deal for us to stand in front of the church and recite a poem for the people of the church. And so I think that's where it really started. I've never really went back that far to really connect it to that, but I think that has a lot to do with the beginning of my love for poetry, you know, the rhyming of poems with kids and how they love to use rhyming poems together. I think that's what really started it. Right, right. Now, um, when when you made the decision, what was the motivating factor in, in putting together your first book? Well, I have been, you know, like, like you read in my bio, thank you so much. Um, you know, like you read in my bio, uh, when I came to New York, uh, you know, the idea is to expose yourself as much as possible. So going around, I went around like a lot of poets do in New York and read their work. Hopefully a publisher will hear you. And that's what happened to me. So I just so happened to be hanging out in the Cornelia Street Cafe group of downtown poets. And they, they, uh, they ca caught up with me and said, we would like to publish your work. And so I moved here in 2007. So it was about four or five years. And then Three Rooms Press asked me, could they publish my first book? Right, excellent, excellent. Now, when you first started writing, what yeah. were the subjects that you covered? And are you covering those same subjects now or are you exploring new subjects? I'm, I'm exploring new subjects. Um, uh, at the beginning, it was more community. Close to the tree represents me being close to the tree, the community, close to, close to my roots, close to my family, close to my mother, close to my grandmother, close to my father, close to people that are so important, my teachers, the people that have been in inspirations to me all my life. So it's like, that's what close to the tree, that's the metaphor of close to the tree. And um, yeah, it expands, you know, it expands as we grow uh, to social justice, to education, to marginalization, to discrimination, to genderism, ageism, sex sexuality, all those kinds of things, I'm beginning to delve more deeper into my work now. All right, excellent, excellent. Now this first project that, that, that's okay. published, is it, is it self-published or, or is it through a, through a, through a uh, no. public? Did you self-publish? Three Rooms Press, no, I've never, I've never self-published, but Three Rooms Press is a independent press in New York City. They, they, they are an independent press and um, they, published that first chat book for me 
Um, they sat down with me and asked me the, you know, how do I want to, you know, how do I want to lay the book out? And that's the thing, that's the confrontation that I had learning the industry, um, the whole conflict between self-publishing and publishing. Oh, Robert, somebody wants to publish you. That's a good thing. Well, it's a good thing if you know the publishing industry, but if you don't know the business, then there's where the conflict comes. So all of my people out there that's listening to me that have never been published, please study the industry and make sure that you align with people that really support your work is my my suggestion right now can you dive into that a little deeper like what was what was the like how would you describe your how was the how would you describe the process for you for yourself from start from start to finish from like from like well, you had the concept of the book to to to, let, to to finally getting it printed yeah thank you that's a great question noel thank you so much that that is a question for a lot of poets because uh, most poets that I know in the business, they don't know the publishing side of it. They say, okay, so I'm publishing this particular chat book or this particular work, but then it's the marketing, it's the, it's the, it's the promotion. And usually traditionally, that's a publishing company that does all that work for the celebrated writers, for the writers that can sell 400,000 copies, you know, immediately even before the book comes out. But for those of us that are on this, this grassroots level, we need to know that, you know, that they will promote, they will, they will publish your book, but then you have to take ownership of your work, meaning that you have to go out. Most of the books that I've sold, Noel, I have sold from reading. So, you know, uh, Three Rooms Press, tried their best, they did what they did, they published the book, they put the book out in the world, but then it was this other layer that I had no knowledge about, about promoting your work to the to the world. You know what I'm saying? Right, right, that's a, and that's yeah. a process that's important to, to, to understand because when, even when you're dealing with a small press, um, I find that small press and self-publishing is similar in that regard of you having to take the responsibility yes. of promoting yourself. So self it's oh, yes. to know that oh, yeah. to know that piece of it because you you are right. in control of who your audience is, you know, who you who who you That's right. give the book to. So it's important to be prepared to That's do right. that work. So it's very it's very important that you that you pointed that out. Now what was that feeling right. like? And, and you know, that feeling was that feeling at first, you know, it was like, oh, you know, you are published. That's a good thing. That's a good feeling. But then after a while, that wanes. It 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 burns out. And then you coming down to the real energy. And the energy is that my book, I want my book to eventually evolve. And oftentimes it takes more than one book. You know, fortunately for me, I have a very supportive community in New York. So you know, my second, the second one that came out, Flight, that was a chat book, but you see it, it was from 2012 to 2019 before I published something else. And that was because I had went, I had gone through my energy, gone to graduate school and made other connections. And so the Flight is the copy, it, it's really my graduate thesis. You know, we had to create new poems in that grad program. And so this publisher out of New Jersey decided that they would publish that graduate thesis. And that's what flight is based on. It's based on a metaphorical flight that I took from New York to Oregon one summer. Yeah. Right. Now, when you were, when you were, yeah. putting, when you were putting the book together, like who, who, right. who were the people in your life um, that were involved in helping you um, get the project done? Like who are your, who are your, who are your supporters or influencers? Mostly, mostly my close friends that are poets here in New York, or you know, some of my family members. They always support me, and uh, uh, mostly the editors that I've, I've aligned myself with. I think that's very, very important. You know, instead of rushing to be published, I really think that you know you should develop a relationship with that editor prior. And you know, there are lots of editors that come at me now, but it's not like, no, I'm not jumping to be published anymore. I'm jumping to be realized that my work can, my work can really make a difference in the world because that's more important 
to just being published. Uh, the whole idea is being published is a good thing. I'm not fighting against that, but also using the work to make change. I mean, social change, educational change, marginalization change, those kinds of changes that the work would influence young men of color or young people of color or students that I've taught in the past. Those kinds of things are very, very important to me that they look at my work as respectable, not something that just has two book covers on it. Right, right. Yeah. Now, if you had, if you had to, if you, if you, if you had to choose between self-publishing and dealing with a small press or a major publisher, like, like, what, what route would you choose? Like, what, what, what would be your preference and why? Or, or do you? I have mean, a for my brothers and sisters out there, I do have a preference. You know, for my brothers and sisters out there that that have self-published i don't i don't see anything wrong with that you know if that's the route that they choose they obviously chose that route to take ownership of their own book career but again even with self-publishing it's just like you still have to know the industry you still have to know the machinations of what you're going to go through as far as marketing and taking your book to the next level or getting your work into the hands of someone that can promote like a lot of poets don't have agents you know actors and musicians and all of those the other art areas have agents but rarely do you see a poet that have an agent that can represent them out in the world. They, it does happen. There are poets that I know in New York with agents and it can happen, you know, that represent you in the larger world of, of literary art, but you know, that's a rare occurrence for poets. And so, but, and so they can represent you in the world. They can get you the spots, the commercials and all those kinds of things. But, you know, again, you have to be your own mogul. You have to be your own businessman. You have to be your own marketer. You have to be your own promoter. You have to create your own work. And so I agree with the brothers that are proactive and the sisters that are proactive in their work and they create their own reality. That's fine. But for me, I prefer, I think that my route would be to work through the literary agencies. Right, right, definitely, definitely. Now, when you were putting this book together, yeah. who, who would you say, who would you consider to be your inspirations in, 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 this, in this project? Um, well, I have so many. I mean, like, you know, my, my, um, my mother used to read poems to me when I was a kid, you know, she used to read the poems of Langston Hughes to me. And I, I know about Baldwin, I know about Richard Wright, I know about Zora, I know about all of the literary stars and all of the kind of stuff I've studied them. But then it's the grassroots people. It's my second grade teacher that put me in the spelling bee. It's my seventh grade teacher, you know, that encouraged me to read certain, you know, read certain uh, stories. My high school teachers that, said Robert you 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 have a good voice you have a you're a good writer so really you know pursue writing if that's what you want to do I do have a lot of people to thank including my family in Florida my family in Georgia my families in DC my families here in New York around the country you know a lot of people have really inspired me to pursue my dream and to be able to live the life of a poet in New York City is a great thing but it's a difficult thing it's not an easy road you know yeah, definitely, definitely. It does, it does take work, but, you know, right. it's definitely, you yeah. definitely enjoy the rewards uh, 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 once once you put in the work. Yes. You know, when you're doing something that you're passionate about, that's yes. really yes. make a difference. You have sure. to put in the work. You're right, my friend. You have to put in the work. And that's the thing. A lot of people live in this city and, and other places that I know, they are in fantasy with it. Oh, I'm a writer, but they don't ever write. You know, they, they might write once in a while, but they want to be a writer. Well, it takes it takes work just like everything else. It's something that Mary Oliver has always taught me is through her work is that if you're passionate about this writing, then you will pursue it every day like a job, you know? Right, exactly, exactly. Now, of all the subjects that you write about, is there any subject in particular that you like to write about more than others? Well, I'm, I, you know, I, my undergrad degree, I went to Florida a and in, in Tallahassee, Florida, and I, my undergrad degree is in history. So most of my poetry or most of the work that I've written, because I've written more than poetry, but most of my work that I've written has a historical lens to it. You know, I grew up, I grew up in a state that's, I can say that um, sometimes it's misunderstood and most of the time it's not misunderstood, but sometimes it's misunderstood. And I try my best in my work 
I'm, I, you know, I used to be ashamed to tell people I was from Florida, but you know, then I said, not the people that I know, not the people that I grew up with, not the people that have supported me and loved me all my life. Those people from Florida have been supported, strong supporters in my life. You know, and I didn't grow up in the wealth that you see of Florida or the people that you know that's always in the news or always in the newspaper about Florida, but Florida has another story. And I'm a part of that other story. There is a positive message from Florida. There is a positive history that comes out of Florida. Florida is not always in the news in a negative light. And so me being from Florida, me being a product of Florida, I'll tell you a quick story. I had always wanted to be a part of the Palm Beach Poetry Festival and they had never ever, and I, I'm, I'm from that part of the, the, the state and they had never ever I felt like they didn't know who I was or they didn't recognize me. And for many years, I had applied for the fellowship or the, the application process and never was accepted. And still, to this day, I haven't. But I do believe in my work and in my genius enough that one day I will be asked to come and read at that particular festival in Florida. And if I don't, oh well. I'm still proud to be a Floridian. Maybe that's not my journey. And that's the way I look at it. I used to get very upset because I was denied a certain fellowship or just denied a certain residency or didn't get this prize or didn't get that prize. But it's about the journey. It's not about the residencies and the prizes all the time. Sometimes it's just that we have to go through these situations to understand that what is worthy is not always easy. And if it was easy, then the rich would live and the poor would die. Exactly. I'm in, I'm in, full, uh, I'm in full agreement. You know, sometimes we have to recognize when, when, a, when, a, when a door or opportunity is not for us. And we have to remind ourselves right. that they're individuals and, you know, our poetic journey yes. is different. You know, yours is different from mine. Mine is different from yours, but right. we have to recognize right. that, you know, our journeys are valid. You know, we have to find, the, um, celebrate our differences. You know, we don't have to write or sound yeah. like anybody else, you know, in this, in this poetry scene. And, and, and like you said, you know, nope. every fellowship, every, you know, um, event or opportunity is not for us. Sometimes there's a reason yes, why right. that door stays closed. So we have to accept that right. that opportunity is for us because there are opportunities that are specifically tailor made just for you. That's right. That's and right. And that. That. But that comes with growth too. Right. You know, you know like you know, because in, in this business, just like any other art, you know, it's competition. It's anger, it's jealousy, it's resentment, it's 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 it's, it's this, it's that, it's why did he had why did he get that? Why didn't I get that? You know, those kinds of things resonate with people. And and I can't judge that on people. I just know from myself to speaking to you on this important interview to me that I had to grow in that area. I had to grow, you know? Definitely. I had to grow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and that leads me to my next next question, because you hear right. you hear conversations about representation, you know, rep representation, you know, identity, you know, the importance right. of those things. How important is it is it for you to make sure that you represent yourself in your totality, whether it's, you know, representing yourself as a man, as a black man, uh, or a person of color, you know, right. whether you, whether, whether you discuss, you know, religion, or other aspects of your life, how important it is, how important is it for you to make sure that you're representing yourself in your, in your in your complete totality. In right. that's, a great, that's a great question. Thank you. I um, you know, that that's been a long journey. You know what I'm saying? And so again, we are seeking the truth. You know, we are being authentic. We are trying to, you know, be authentic. And oftentimes people want to go for, they want to go for the gold. They want to go for, they want to go for the hot open mic. They want to go for you know, they want to go for, you know, they want to go for what makes the crowd say, wow, you know, and oftentimes that's not the issue either. It's about reading the audience, you know, evolving as a person, you know, being mature and, and, and really telling the truth about who you are. You know, I lied about myself for many years. You know, I lied about my sexuality. I lied about who I was. And so those kinds of things also come up in the work, 
you know, that I can tell people that I am a black gay man, you know, and so that was hard for me because of my background, because of where I come from, you know, because of religion, because of tradition, not my family, because my family has always loved me, but because of the situation that I was placed in. And so I had to conform to that and I had to grow beyond that, you know, and so I wasn't always truth a truth teller but now that i'm older and i understand myself and the way i move in the world i'm trying to be more truthful about who i am and in my and it reflects in my work I absolutely and that's very important because I, I've, I've always believed in being transparent you know through my creativity yeah. you know right. people people will resonate with you when you're transparent with who you are and yeah. what you stand for and your subject matter. So yes. uh, you know, I commend you for making that decision to be yourself, to stand out from the crowd. Yeah. Because that's very important. Because if you choose to blend in with other people just for the sake of being seen, then you lose yourself in the process. You lose your yes. identity. You lose your mission of what you want to stand yeah. for. So uh, right. you know, I commend you on exercising the importance of being yourself and being an individual right. In in in, 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 the large, in this large crowd, you know that we call the poetry scene, because there's a lot of people blending in. Right. You know, and if they choose to do that, you know that's their choice. But you know, there's no there's no reward in blending in. You know, the the, the reward comes from standing exactly. out and being true to yourself and true to what you yes. have to say. So I definitely exactly. commend you for making that decision exactly. to do that because exactly. it shows that you present in your writing. You know. Right. That's, that's Thank you. I appreciate enough. that. Yeah. And so, um, yes, it, it's, it's been a long journey again. Yep. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And, and, and you know, I see, I see the rewards of your work, you know, as I read in your bio, you know, you have, you have accomplished a lot for yourself. And that's something to be very proud of and, and something definitely that's commendable. Uh, what would you, if they, what you. would you say you would want to accomplish with your work? Like, do you have a particular goal or mission with your writing? I, I, I do, you know, there are some, you know, like I come from a tradition, I come, again, I come from the Florida tradition. So I come from, I come from uh, when I hear sing a song full of the hope that the dark past has taught, I think about James um, Weldon Johnson and I think about Zora Neale Hurston and I think about Augusta Savage. And I think about the stories and the legacies that these Floridians have created in the world. And so I come from the Florida tradition, you know, the artists that sought New York or sought the North in order to um, build this type of literary au revoir in order to, you know, celebrate Florida. And that's James Weldon Johnson to me, that's Augusta Savage, who was a sculptor here in Harlem. And also that was uh, Zora, the famous Zora Neale Hurston, also from Florida. And so it, that com I come from that tradition of Floridians being able to really explore the literary world and really build this audience and, and create this whole legacy for themselves. And those are some of the literary ancestors that I, I but then I have the people in Florida that have been my teachers and my, and my, and my, and my community members and people that I grew up with that always reach out to me and always say, Robert, we're proud of the little things that you're doing. I'm proud of the card that you sent me. I'm proud of the, you remember my birthday, or you remember my reunion, you remember my wedding, you remember my anniversary. So those kinds of things too are just as important. So my work to continue evolve, to, to build character, to again, inform change. I am an advocate for men of color. I mean, I like to you know, create work to protect the image of the man of color, you know, because I am a man of color and I know how we can be misunderstood. We can be considered angry or toxic, or we can be considered, um, you know, uh, misrepresented in so many areas of this life. So I am an advocate for that energy too. So, yeah. Awesome. That's excellent. That's excellent. Yeah. yeah. Now at this time, I'm going to share my screen again. Okay. Because um, now it's time um, when I ask you to take this time for you to take the mic. So at this time, Robert, I'm going to give you an opportunity at this time to share up to five poems of your choosing to okay. give our audience an idea of, 
of what your writing is all about. So all right, I think thank you. was yours. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. This, this piece is for Nelson Mandela. We want to, Nelson Mandela, this has an epigraph by Derek Walcott. It therefore becomes necessary for the writer to make repeated unending explorations of the same territory since every journey throws up new truths. And this is an epigraph by Derek Walcott for, for Nelson. We want to plant an old soul in new ground this time, this death of death, the mass of everlasting. The year has become a pure spirit, a disappearance of the great matriarchs and patriarchs, the saints and the ancestors. But who will be left after the judgment, after Harriet Tudman's great sojourner truth meets Deborah and Ruth? I want to plant an old soul in new ground to call us the new black, the new white, the new color, the renaissance of the African naissance. And he died on the Congo cross, on the Coptic with helicopters and fuselages, with the barrage of bullets into humanity in Robins, with Dennis, with Tutu, with the blue blood, the defrock, the elders and the griot and displace them underground. And what is Africa to me? Nothing to do with my American, my black boy on the corner of Lennox. Nothing to do with my brothers without marginalized, penalized on the jury of their peers, their fears of a black nation, the care not to lose control. And we are a redistrict. We are a red line. We are a double standard in this old soul, in this new ground. And there are sure to be war and immigration and welfare and emancipation. And who will celebrate another born and a better way in my neighborhood? And my could if I could, and my want because I want. And there is the paradox. And he is pure spirit and pure voice. His history in the chariots of James Weldon Johnson and W.E.B. Du Bois, and this call to pan African, this negritude, and all the poets of the Black Bottom without language, just anger and poverty, a slaughter of bulls for sacrifice, die dancing and praising the lesser God and the rape of a Kimberly mine, the fall of Sun City, the pity of pittance, the meager trope of this present age and the singing shall stop. The hymns shall be no more in this colonial antebellum. And do not title me reverie, more rivalry than chivalry, more killing fields than to till this soil and there is oil beneath the earth where smoke and mirth and acid and masses of burial grounds are found again. Freedom for the free in a free land. 100 sonnets burn across the bloody sky until our end of our destruction to fuse what was with what is, I remain undone. That's from Nelson Mandela. I'll change it a little bit. Um, awesome piece. I want more than a vacation in the Caribbean. There were squawking roosters and lizards. There were purple mountains and the mountains looked like pyramids. So I shuttled near Mount Misery and there was plenty of time to write and retreat along my feet to swim like Hemingway or F. Scott. But I was there to write a novel, just marvel at the infinite atmosphere. Charles de Gaulle, five hours back across the international date I want to find Voltaire and Rimbaud. I want to read Spinoza or Bertrand Russell. But this was my first time in Paris. In Senegalese grass made jacket checking all the facts. I tried to ask for directions, tried to connect in English, but it was the snobbery of a French breakfast. The method of maps and apps. So I gleaned on the Eiffel and leaned like the Pisa. This is for the Harlem Globe Trotters, Harlem Globe Trotters, elegy to the Harlem Globe Trotters. I did not see them. Only their massive hands and bodies and statistics of 6'5 and 6'6, six, six, big Apollos that had names like lightning and streak and spark plug. They probably hung from telephone wires like, like sneakers, but I did not see them. Only a fragment, 
a cut square of grandma's leftover cloth to make the entire quilt, pieces and shavings, belief that gave them she kept from older projects, the arm of a sleeve, a leave of a Bible verse. The people kept everything in case of a hurricane. They filled the foot tub with water and covered the mirror. And we were asked not to talk on the telephone. And there were their superstitious ways. And this is how we behave when we listen to grown folks conversation. They would spit tobacco juice in our eye. And if you wished on a star, we would get a sty. You better go outside and play. She would say, listening to grown folks business. So we shifted to our childhood. We listened out for motherhood because one day we would be grown and we would have to take this stuff to our homes. So grandma kept all the obituaries, all the programs from Terry service. And I did not see them only a made for television docudrama, a romantic version. They could not record the purging when we stood in line for castor oil or cod liver oil, when we wrapped our sandwiches in aluminum foil. We were never behind glass. All our food came from the cast of a spider skillet and crock pots with rickety lids that sat until church was over. And then we would smell over her shoulder. This exhibit was just a penance of the story. Each one had more to say. I had stood in line, had did their time, hoping that they could play, but the way only came through prayer, through the sharing of collection and plates and tides and envelopes from folding chairs from the back of big church buses. They would raise an offering for the Holy Ghost coffers. They prayed for their children. And when they left home and begged them to listen and probably like me was told, do not forget that song. Do not forget what your mama said. Do not forget what your dead grandpa said. He was sick and afflicted with the gout. So how can this exhibit word of mouth? So I stood there and hope the exhibit that I paid $18 to see would speak to me. I'll do one more, thank you. This is for October. I followed the drinking gourd in October. October would not be the old October, not the one that I prepared for being a year older. The color of saffron and bleeding red falling down on me tamarind, a kind of transformation from urban to agrarian. My birthday wish for a miniature pumpkin patch in front of my window. It is not the beginning, but the ending. October becomes May or March. November is the old October, the celebration of old souls and saints, a designated day of the dead, a reliquary for my glorified grandmother and a fortified big sister. They left us with the people who could fly. They followed us through the drinking gourd across the Ohio River over into Beulah or Jubilee or Canaan or Bethesda with Harriet Tudman and Sojourner Truth to the Hey, Robert, are you still there? I think your screen froze. Okay. Let's see here. October. October, they followed the drinking gourd. October would not be the old October, not the one that I prepared for it being a year older. The color of saffron and bleeding red falling down on me tamarind, a kind of transformation from urban to agrarian. My birthday wish for a miniature pumpkin patch in front of my window. It is not the beginning, but the ending. October becomes May or March. November is the old October, the celebration of old souls and saints a designated day of the dead, a reliquary for a glorified grandmother and a fortified big sister. They left us with the people who could fly. They followed the drinking gourd across the Ohio River over into Beulah or Jubilee or Canaan or Bethesda with Harriet Tudman in Sojourner Truth to the great by and by. Wow, awesome, awesome. Excellent selections of poetry, man. Thank you so much for coming through to share Thank those. Powerful Thank pieces, you. powerful pieces. I appreciate um, it. Um, before we close, I'm just going to um, um, share a couple of more things. Just a second. Okay. Let's pull this up as PowerPoint. All right. 
At this time is our audience Q and Q and A session. Um, I don't see any questions in the sh in the chat, but um, I got a couple of questions that I want to pose to you. And one of, okay. them, one of them is dream collaborations. Now, if there were any, if there's any poets that you would love to collaborate with, whether live, whether alive or, or deceased, who would you choose to collaborate with and why? Oh. oh, man, that's such a great question. I never thought about that. I would love to collaborate with Langston Hughes. He was like one of the first blues poets that I know of. That would love to, I would love to collaborate with Baldwin. I would love to collaborate with Alvin Ailey. I, I would love to. I would love to do something with Basquiat. I mean, like, there's a few people out there. I would love to collab. There's a dream collaboration. I'm telling you, those would be my dream collaborations. Yes, excellent. I would love to collaborate with Augusta Savage too, and James Weldon Johnson. Songs and sculptures. Oh yes, I would love that. Yeah, and I think that's a great question because. Noel, that's the thing. That's the, that's why I did that thing with Amy Williams. She was an, a visual artist, and I wrote the poem to Zora. She painted the paintings to Zora, and so it's it's about collaboration because I think when two or three people come together and collaborate, then that just increases the power of the work. To me, that's what I believe. Awesome, awesome, excellent. And uh, what, yeah. what what's 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 coming up for you in the future? What what do you have? Do you have any other projects or events coming up that you'd like to share with our audience? Yes, I um I do have a book coming out in October that the publisher of Three Rooms Press has already decided to publish because of the fact that she wants to submit that particular manuscript to an award contest. So that's coming up. And uh, you know, just really just figuring out my next collaboration. I am down. I am open to collaboration with people if people are interested in creating new work. Um, I I have I I do have this infatuation with Scott Joplin right now. So it's just like, I'm trying to, you know, read all the information that I can read on Scott Joplin's legacy. And I'm trying to create poems to him, possibly a one man show that I could shop around New York and just, you know, still work into the areas that I love to explore so much because there's so much unwritten history out there that, that's yet to remain open to the world. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Uh, before yeah. we before we close, can you share where you can be found on social media? I can be found on social media under my name Robert Gibbons and under my name on Instagram Anthony Robert Gibbons. Anthony is actually my middle name, but on Instagram is Anthony Robert Gibbons. So you can just definitely connect with me on Instagram at Anthony Robert Gibbons. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Now at this time, before we close this out for the evening, I want to take this time to say thank you. I want to thank you, Robert, thank you. for being my yes. guest. Awesome episode. Thank you so much for sharing your powerful poetry. And yes. I wish you all the best with your future endeavors. Thank you, my uh, brother. Well, if you wish to connect with Poets with Purpose, you can connect yes. with the Facebook group Poets with right. Purpose. Um, yeah. I can also be found on Twitter at Sign Poets W Purpose. Right. And the YouTube channel Poets with Purpose, you know, same name. Stay tuned right. for episode 14 coming up featuring Rescue Poetics, Suzanne right. Justin Giano. Right. Uh, that interview is taking place Saturday, August 14th, 2021 at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I will definitely be here. And I, I would like, just like to say, um, Noel, thank you so much for what you do in the world, how you support poets. I think that's an amazing journey. I think that, you know, that I will definitely support and promote your work here in New York. And also just people out there like you are so valuable and you're, you're never really ever really given the credit for what you do. And that is you do kind of like a ministry, you know, like you are like ministry. I mean, like really you support artists that somebody in the world might hear their voice or somebody might buy their chat book or buy their work or reach out to them and say, hey, I have a gig for you or I have something for you. So I appreciate people like you and what you do in the world. So thank you again for having me here. And any way I can help, I will be there for you. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Robert. That's much appreciated. I really appreciate right. that. Thank you. Appreciate right. the support. And for those of you right. in the audience that wish to connect with me, I can reach that 646-372-6230 or email poetswithpurpose at gmail.com. And i also like to share that my all of my logos and flyers were designed by the awesome team at Eclipse Graphics New York. They can be found on Instagram at sign Eclipse Graphics NY if you like to connect with them and see samples right. of their work. 
And lastly, if you guys, anyone in our audience like to make a donation, I can be found on PayPal, uh, Cash App, and Zelly. And with that, wow, ladies great. and gentlemen, that is a wrap. Robert, thank you again for being thank my you. guest. This was an awesome right. episode. Great poetry. Right. Um, right. Glad conversating with you. Everyone, have a good night. Right. God bless. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being a part. Right. Thank you. Good night. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. All right.